I have been meaning to do an LFS stream series for quite a while now, probably like three or so months, and a couple of weeks back, I finally got around to doing so. We're nowhere near done, right now we're about six hours in, and around the midpoint, you can sort of argue about that, because right now we are in chapter seven, and chapter eight is also the longest chapter in the entire book, so... Whether you want to call it the midpoint or not is really up to you, but it's roughly the midpoint. So during those two streams, I've sort of had a lot of thoughts about going through LFS, and I wanted to put those together in one video, sort of as my first impressions, and whether I think, you know, doing this is worth it altogether. Now, for the people who have absolutely no idea what LFS is, let's just start with a brief introduction. So LFS, otherwise known as Linux from scratch, basically is as the name would suggest. It is a set of instructions laid out in a fairly well laid out book for building a Linux system completely from the ground up. Now, sometimes LFS gets referred to as a sort of like a minimal Linux distribution, like not just minimal like say Arch, Genju or Void, Minimal as in like the most minimal you can get, but I don't think it even makes sense to consider LFS a distro altogether. When you start LFS, you don't get an ISO or anything like that. We are actually building everything up from the ground up. We actually bootstrap the system from an existing system. So you literally start with nothing. It'll go and instruct you to set up things like petitions so you have a place to actually build the LFS system. From there, it'll tell you where to go and download the source code for the various applications you're going to need. And with that, you're going to use your host system compiler. So the system that, you know, currently works, whatever distro you're currently using, to go and compile a cross compiler. And that cross compiler will then go and compile the main compiler. And that main compiler will then go and compile all of the applications being used on that system. So things like, you know, your Perl interpreter, Python, whatever other stuff you're going to need to actually get your system actually working as you'd expect it to work. Now, when you finish the entire LFS process, you're not going to have like a graphical environment or a web browser or any, actually you might have a text-based browser that, yeah, but you're not going to have like what you'd expect from a modern Linux distribution. You're going to have a Linux system that boots into a TTY, and that's all you need. There's no networking, nothing like that. Now, if you want to go and do that stuff, that is all going to be included in a follow-up to LFS known as BLFS or Beyond LFS. And assuming I actually get the LFS system working and booting everything I need it to do, I'm probably going to continue the series on and do BLFS and, you know, get a Linux distribution that might actually be usable. Now, LFS for the most part is really, really well documented, and in a lot of cases, it sort of needs to be because a lot of the things that it goes over don't really have extensive documentation in many other places. Things like, what is the minimal compiler toolchain you actually need to go and compile the full GCC compiler to actually go and compile the rest of the tools you need on your system? It probably exists somewhere out there, and people who are very familiar working with GCC probably already know this, but I don't know anywhere that sort of goes over this outside of LFS. It also does a fantastic job at explaining the concepts being used inside of LFS that are fundamental to understanding what is actually being done. For example, there is a big explanation on what cross-compilation actually is. You don't need to know this to go and actually run the commands that are used to do the cross-compilation, but it's very likely that if you're going through LFS, you've never actually come across this concept before, so if you're using LFS as a way to learn about how Linux actually is built, something like this is sort of fundamental to understanding the system. Now, while most of LFS is really, really well documented, there is one part that anyone who watched that first live stream is going to realize is a bit of a mess. And that is chapter two under preparing for the host system. So in here, we set up petitions and it tells you the petitions that you might want to use, what they do, why you might want to have them. 
but there's two really important bits of information that it completely skips out on. The first one is what file systems it recommends using, and secondly, is LFS being built against UEFI or BIOS? Now, at this stage, because I've read further into the book in chapter 10.4, I realize that LFS is using BIOS but it makes absolutely no mention of this while you're setting up your petitions. And if you've ever done something like Gen 2 or Arch, you would realize this is very important information for setting up your boot petition. Now, I do understand why it is brought up in 10.4, because if we scroll down to that section, 10.4 is about the bootloader. So obviously you need to know what you're using if you're using UEFI or BIOS because the way you set up Grub is going to be very different. But if you set up your boot petition wrong, you would now need to go all the way back, go and resize your petitions, make sure that they actually get resized properly, and then go from there. Honestly, what I should have done when going through this section is just went and read the Arch or the Gen 2 documentation and get my petition set up like that. That, I would say, is probably the biggest hurdle in the entirety of what I've been doing with LFS. Because, like Arch, like Gen 2, probably like Void and the various sorts of BSD as well, LFS, it's not difficult. It's very time consuming, absolutely. There's no argument that LFS is not time consuming, but it's not difficult. For example, let's say you're compiling something like N cursors. All you do is you untar and you run the commands that are on this screen and read the commands as well. That's very important so you know, you know, what you're actually learning and actually learning something. Uh, but actually going through the LFS process isn't difficult because of how much documentation there is on things like compiling code and everything like that. If you understand the install process for something like Arch Linux, it's fairly reasonable to get it installed in like half an hour to an hour. With six hours of work, because we have to compile everything ourselves and manually go through everything, I have gotten to the point where I have cherooted into my system. I don't have any tools installed outside of like the tools to compile the other tools, but I have a technically a system. That's how far I've gotten. So it's probably going to take me at least, I would say at least another 10 hours to get everything else done. That seems reasonable. And then going through the BLFS process, God, that could take another 20. So all up, it's probably going to be like a 40 or so hour project. Maybe a waste of time, but certainly not difficult. Also, streaming is kind of weird in this case. I don't understand why people want to sit there and watch me compile code for three hours. But outside of the code compilation sections, I've gotten a lot of really useful advice. And honestly, I've kind of learned more from my chat than I've learned from LFS itself. Not to say that LFS is a bad learning tool, because that's the primary reason you go through something like LFS. If you go and slowly read everything, you read all of the commands, you read all of the explanation of the options, there is a lot of stuff to learn in LFS. Maybe it's not going to be practical for the way you typically use Linux, but if you're interested in sort of how everything pieces together, LFS is a, it's a really great learning tool for that. But I feel like having that chat there also just gives people the opportunity to sort of I guess, give their own feedback on the approaches that are being taken in LFS and explain why the approach they would take instead might be a better option. Granted, you do get a lot of bad advice, things like make your root petition NTFS, but things like that are sort of obvious trolling. Where it becomes a problem is things that sort of look like good advice, but in those cases, you sort of have to weigh it against what other people are saying and judge whether what that person is saying actually really makes any sense or if they're just trying to mess with you. I know that most people going through LFS aren't going to sort of have this experience, but if you are a streamer, a YouTuber, or you have any sort of audience like this, it is going to be a very different experience going through it on stream than doing it offline. On the bright side though, the stream certainly does keep me motivated to keep working through the project rather than taking breaks every five minutes to go and do something else.
Now, because I happen to have an Arch Linux VM just sitting around, I am building LFS on top of Arch Linux. But you don't have to use Arch. You can use literally any Linux distro out there. You can use Arch, Gentoo, Void, Debian, Mint, even something like Ubuntu, assuming that the host system meets all of the, uh, all of the requirements to actually build LFS. Most systems are going to have at least these package versions. There is one problem with using Ubuntu that makes some people recommend not using it. But this script right here is going to let you check for all of those things you might need. The problem with Ubuntu is by default, it symlinks sh to dash and it uses a different version of, um, of orc compared to what is recommended inside of LFS. But both those things can be very easily fixed and once you do, there's no reason why you can't use Ubuntu. However, you don't even need to have an installed system. If you really want to, you could just do it from a live CD for something like Arch, Gentoo, Void, whatever you want to use. Just anything that lets you access a TTY or a terminal from the live CD. It's very likely the live CD is going to have everything you need installed already and you can just work from that. Now, you will have to make sure you check that just to make sure everything is working as you'd expect, but it should be fine. I just wanted to troll my audience by using Arch with GNOME, so I just did it like that. Now, you might be wondering, why am I not doing this on hardware? If I'm doing this on Arch, why not? Well, there's a couple of problems with this. Firstly, LFS needs its own petitions, and I don't want to mess with the petitions on my main system, so I'd have to go and buy another hard drive and do it on that. But even so, doing something like LFS on hardware can be very dangerous because you're doing things like messing with your Chiroot, messing with bootloaders, and you may very well break your main system. So like with any other sort of testing of a distro or anything like that, it's much, much safer to do it in a virtualized environment where if you break something, you break the VM and then you can just restart without having to go and, you know, reinstall your entire system. Plus, the VM has some really nice advantages, one of those being save states. So, one of the problems with LFS is when you shut down your system, because you're running a system inside of a system, you will have to do some setup process every time the computer restarts. So, changing back to the LFS user, resetting some variables, remounting some drives, but inside of the VM, when I'm done, all I need to do is save the state and I can just close the program without the VM really shutting down. And the vast majority of the setup process is going to be exactly the same. The only thing that will be different is when I get to setting up my GPU drivers in like BLFS, that's a long way away, but when I get up to that, uh, because I'm using VirtualBox, I will need to use the VMware drivers rather than the regular AMD drivers like I would use if I was running this on hardware. But outside of that, I can't think of a single difference. Now, the big question is, do I think LFS is actually worth it? Now, obviously, this is still my first impression, so I can't speak for the ending of the entire process, but from what I've done, from the six hours I've done, is it worth going through? Now, this sort of depends on why you want to do LFS. If you're approaching LFS as a learning tool to learn how Linux is built from the ground up, learn how all of these programs are compiled, learn what the different compile options do, you know what? LFS is perfectly good as a learning tool. You will get to a point around the middle where you're not really learning anything. All you're doing is just doing tar-xf, make, tar-xf, make, tar-xf, make, and you do that for about four hours. At that point, sure, it's a massive waste of time, but all of the stuff around that middle section, I feel like there is a lot of useful information you can glean from that. It is information that is going to be there and is going to be perfectly skippable. So... You have to make sure that if you're trying to learn from LFS, you are taking the process slow and actually trying to understand the information. If your goal instead is to have a very custom and incredibly minimal Linux distribution 
I think you're sort of insane by going through this approach, but if you go through LFS and, you know, get rid of the stuff that you don't need, sure, you will get to that point by the end of it, even though you've wasted a lot of time and you're probably much better off going with something like Gen 2, Arch, Void, Bedrock, all of the traditional minimal Linux distributions rather than going through LFS. But if you want to, go right ahead. If your goal instead is to have something challenging, well, I don't know why you're installing Linux distributions because none of them are difficult to install. Most of them are fairly well documented. If you really want to find something difficult like that though, try out something like Suicide Linux, where whenever you make a mistake, the system is just going to kill itself. But outside of that, you're not going to find a Linux distribution that is hard to install or a Linux system that is hard to set up. So at this stage, I'm going to be doing LFS all the way until it's done. Once we are done with the first section, I'm probably going to do a follow-up to this video. And then the same thing once I get into BLFS, I'll talk about my first impressions there and then talk about what I'm going to do at the end. In the final episode of this series, I'm probably going to talk about, you know, whether I'm going to like release an ISO or something like that because people keep asking me to actually have one. But for today, I think that's going to be it. So if you like this video, and you want to support the channel and become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon subscribe, it's only BearerPay, linked in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over Tea available basically anywhere. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robson Plays where I live stream twice a week, upload about five or six YouTube shorts, and this gets streamed on a Saturday once a week, assuming I don't take a break. And also this channel is available over on Odyssey. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.